Blog Talk Radio. Hello, everyone. I'm Alan Pockotter, and you're listening to Call Talk for June 19th. 2019. Today's topic is gamification, incentives, and engagement, a new look. If you're listening live, we invite you to be part of the show and ask questions. Here's how you do it. Email me at calltalk at benchmarkportal.com. I want to remind everyone that all of our shows are archived and available to listen to at benchmarkportal.com any time of the day. And now I'd like to introduce the host of the show, Bruce Belfiore. Thank you, Alan, and welcome back to Call Talk, everyone. As Alan mentioned, today we'll be talking about gamification, incentives, and engagement. Gamification has been used in contact centers for some time now, and so far the results have been, well, mixed. Some really spectacular and some not-so-good results. So the question arises, why do some gamification and engagement programs work so well for some organizations? but fall flat for others. Now, if you understand the science and principles of engagement, gamification, and incentives, you really do have the power to change an organization. You can improve morale, increase tenure, see metric improvement, all of which promotes a healthy organization that helps you toward your business goals. There's a lot here to talk about, and that's why we wanted to bring in an expert on the topic, Elijah Cox, Chief Operating Officer at Snowfly, Inc., Welcome to the show, Elijah. Hi, thanks, Bruce. I really appreciate being here today. Okay, great. Well, a little bit of background on Elijah before we get to the questions and how he got into this. So uh, fresh out of the military and religious service, and he did two tours overseas and also participated in disaster relief here in the United States. So we thank Elijah for his service to to the country. Uh, Elijah stumbled on Snowfly. Uh, leading gamification-based incentive engagement and analytics company that focuses on people and understands and leverages human psychology. So he's mm-hmm. participated in effective programs and created tools that have helped transform organizations and uh, helped to uh, boost engagement. So this is all great. And, Elijah, let's start by um, you know, asking. You've been in the contact center space for almost a decade. What are some of the things, gamification and engagement, uh, those elements that you've seen really work and impress you? And uh, please insert a definition of gamification for those of our listeners who are are new to this topic. That would be very helpful. Okay? (laughs) Sure thing. So uh, from my experience and the things that that we've really seen, um, and especially with the the positive and negative kind of programs, it's the best programs. Um, aren't like standalone or isolated programs, but they in, they really engage the entire life cycle and the entire experience of the participants. Um, so it's not just the beginning; it's not just a little isolated event. Um, so back in the day, I mean, back in the early 2000s, our, our founder, uh, Dr. Brooks Mitchell, um, he wrote a book. I mean, literally wrote the book on gamification um, uh, called "Bet on Cowboys." Um, and, it, and he kind of outlines that idea of, uh, of that corporate engagement and how to use gamification. Um, and one of the big things that he outlines is, is that gamification is never the goal. Gamification is the tool. Um, so per your request, <laughs> so gamification, the, the definition that, that we use is um, it, it's the idea of taking a, a mundane or a regular task and adding uh, you know, game principles to those mundane tasks. Um, and, you know, part of the show today is this idea of a new look, um, it, and it's this idea of looking at the word engagement and looking at this word incentives and looking at this word gamification and seeing that they're all the same thing. Um, so, for example, you have a salesman that is, you know, gets a commission for closing a sale, and he gets an incentive in his check, and he's all excited about it. What you've done is taken a mundane sale or a mundane task and added a, a game principle or a reward to it. That's gamification. So gamification mm-hmm. can be very, very simple, like a commission, and it can also be really, really complicated, and you know, I'm sure we'll go into that more. Absolutely. Yeah, no, that's a great 
Great definition. So basically, uh, gamification is uh, making work, uh, you know, into a game that is processed yeah. by the human mind as something fun and rewarding instead of sort of drudge work. So it really uh, <laughs> takes uh, takes the workplace and kind of turns it on its head and makes it a fun place to go. And this this is particularly important, I would imagine, for people who are millennials and uh, the Gen X mm -hmm. uh, and, and Gen Z, uh, uh, or Gen, you know, Gen X, Gen Z people are coming through. I can imagine that well, yeah. it's very important for them in particular. It's very important. And as a Gen Xer um, and just coming into it, um, we, we almost are living in that expectation of, you know, if I have to sit at my desk for eight or, eight or ten hours a day, um, I expect something to break up my time. And then when I'm let down on that expectation, it's very easy for me to be poached by another job that looks more fun or has a pool table in their lobby or whatever that thing may be. Um, and so it really is becoming important to understand how that gamification works for the, for the new generations. Yeah. No, I was at a center recently where they had the ping pong table and the pool table and the games yep. for uh, sales and this and that and the other thing. And a very, it was a happy place. I mean, I have to say yeah. they, they had done it very well. So, Elijah, it, you, know, it you talked about the, yeah, yeah, it worked. And you've talked about the three pillars of a successful engagement program. Uh, so this is sort of gamification, but also just the engagement, you know, writ large. So tell us mm -hmm. about, tell us about those three pillars. Sure. Um, so whenever we consult with an organization, we always make sure to cover what we call these three pillars of a, of a successful program. Um, and the first pillar uh, that we like to talk about is a holistic program. Um, and what that means is just integrating the program into the entire life cycle of the participants. And I kind of already mentioned that before, but, you know, making sure that it's in their regular activity. Uh, making sure that it's part of the life cycle, so it's part of onboarding, it's part of, you know, regular tasks, it's part of performance reviews, and it could even be part of offboarding or, or, or the retirement, but really touching on the entire life cycle. But really the most important part of that holistic is meaning that it applies to the, the mindset of, of the participants. So, for example, um, and <laughs> fun story, so you have an IT manager that's preaching and preaching, you know, on-time delivery with no bugs in our software. You know, every day, that's their mantra, you know, no bugs in the software. And then right after the meeting, he walks over to your desk and he says, hey, I've got all these extra projects for you, and, and they're urgent, and they got to be taken care of today. And, I, you know, I'm really glad this never happens in, in my company. But, but the idea is, is that IT manager living, is he really living a holistic program? Is he involving, is he living the culture that mm. their engagement program is set up to be? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's making sure that people are not just saying the right things, but they're figuring out how to live the right things. It's a holistic kind of program. And some of the ways we do that is like peer recognitions, you know, on the spot recognitions, um, making sure to outline um, the activities that the company is measuring or might reward or might gamify um, so people know what they should be working towards and how they should be working towards those um, but again, it's that, that idea of trying to involve and give the proper information to, to all the participants. So that's the, that's the first pillar. Um, the second pillar, and this is a huge one, um, is making sure that the program is, is set up on the business goals of the organization. So a lot of the programs we see fail are gamification or engagement programs that are, are too, um, too isolated. And so what that means is, uh, the, the, the business goals are, you know, like we want to improve our, our, our KPI of, you know, one and done. And, and so that's kind of all we focus on. And we put all of our gamification into this one and done because we want our one and done rates to, to increase. But the business goal of a company is not to improve your one and done. Your business goal is to engage better with your clients or decrease the number, you know, the volume into your contact center or to improve your bottom line. And when you focus too much on the one and done, or you think that that's your business goal, then it, it isolates the program and people get really bored or they lose out on, you know, your HT times really explode. Your, um, you know, your customer satisfaction scores might really go down because you're so focused on closing that ticket or whatever it may be. So it's very important to know what your actual business goal is and outline mm -hmm. it and then build the program around the business goal 
rather than just saying, hey, you know, let's, you know, let's measure this KPI and see what happens and see if it, if, if it goes up. Um, yeah. And it's and it's really necessary to also to attach um, the gamification principles to these these longer term business goals or these bigger goals. Um, and because of the way that our brains work, um, small little dopamine activities don't cause behavior change. They cause excitement, but they don't actually cause behavior change. And so situating or creating a program. Oh, go ahead, Bruce. No, I was just going to say, before you go on to the excitement uh, phase, just uh, I want to just underline what you're talking about in terms of business goals, because it is so important. And actually, mm-hmm. listeners of this program will know that uh, one of the uh, things that I uh, will bring up again and again is the importance of mission statements and that the uh, mm-hmm. fact that uh, everybody, uh, every center should have a mission statement with, that is in total accord with its uh, uh, enterprise business uh, mission and mission statement. And if you have a straight line, just think of this as a manager for all of our listeners. If you have a straight line that goes through the corporate mission and and through the uh, contact center mission statement and then goes into the business goals that you were just talking about and uh, then goes into the, the flow and the performance metrics and all of those things, if you have a straight line that goes through all of that, then you'll find it very easy to explain to your uh, people to understand and then to take that sort of uh, pile <laughs> of substance, if you will, and uh, you know, gamify that, it will make sense to people and it will, mm-hmm. you know, there won't be dissonance, it will all be, you know, of one piece and it will really help you out a lot. So, I just thought I'd, I'd throw that in before you got to the excitement part, which is very important as well. That is very well said, Bruce. And, and I mean, you said it much more succinctly than than I did, and that idea of make sure your program is supporting your mission statement, and that I mean, well said. Um, and that's our that's our second pillar is is making sure that that program supports the business goals and communicates the business goals. And then third is the excitement. Um, so it, one of the big things we preach, um, and when we see unsuccessful programs, is it, it, this word that I'll use a lot is dilution. So, for example, if I have a sales commission and that sales commission is put into a quarterly check, uh, those individual actions that I did to achieve that commission are diluted by the, the amount in that check. And so when I can separate the commission amounts instead of lumping them all together, then I get much more perceived value out of those, uh, out of those incentives. And it creates a lot more um, excitement about the smaller activities that, I, that I'm performing. Um, so we always try to help our clients kind of break up those activities and see incremental incentives and gamification activities rather than just some big diluted piece at the end of some some arbitrary period. Um, we also try to use this excitement um, to to really give us a rest from the mundane. Working in a contact center is a grind. It's really difficult, which is again why we see so much turnover. Uh, so in Snowfly, we use an actual game system. Uh, they can they can earn tokens in our system and play those tokens, and um, and it gives them a, a 10 to 15 second break. It puts a smile on their face. It creates a little bit of excitement, and we can show from our research that that the agents perform significantly better after having a small mental rest, especially after a difficult call or after a difficult interaction with a peer or or a supervisor. Um, so we also do a lot of other things. Um, we got to make sure that the program is always adapting and changing. A stale program, especially, and Bruce, you pointed out, you know, millennials, Gen X, Gen Z, they have this expectation of like new skins and new activities and new things and new campaigns. Um, and so when an engagement program tends to be stale and old and the same every time they log in, the interest in engagement numbers will drop. And so it's very important to make sure you have, you're very creative with your campaigns um, and even tying into, you know, current culture phenomena to engage people with, you know, current movies and, um, you know, current events and, and those kind of things to create additional emotional attachments, which again goes back to the behavioral science of the brain to make sure that I'm not isolating my engagement activities. I'm, in, I'm integrating my engagement activities, um, which creates longer term behavior change. So those are our three pillars 
that we always talk about whenever we're consulting or setting up a program is a holistic program, a business goal, uh, a program <laughs> focused on business goals, and then an exciting program. And it's not a one-legged stool. And you'll hear me say that a lot. Quite, uh, this is not a one-legged stool. And if you're missing one of those legs, the stool falls down and your program fails. And that's why yeah. we see a lot of these gamification programs that either really succeed or really fail. Key. The, the very, very key concept. They're really, really important there. And uh, on the excitement part, too, um, sometimes people will ask, you know, well, how do I know it's going to be excitement to my peop- exciting to my people? And I always say, ask them. oftentimes you can intuit oftentimes you can understand particularly if you have the same generation uh, the the same uh, kind of background as the people who are in there but otherwise you know one of the things that managers should be doing anyway is having lunch with their people on a periodic Mm -hmm. basis or a regular basis Uh, and you know without necessarily saying okay we're sitting down here at lunch we're going to construct a whole program no (laughs) just find out what are the things that do excite them Uh, use that Mm -hmm. use conversation in order to figure out the sorts of things that you can you can uh, actually put in there and uh, and make for a really successful program okay well you know that's great Mm -hmm. The, the holistic approach the goals and flow the excitement uh these are great do's and um what about some don'ts (laughs) What about some don'ts? One of the biggest problems we see in engagement programs is, um, and and I I don't like to use the word because it does have a very negative connotation, but lazy. Um, A lot of call centers throw incentive money at their agents, you know, perform this well on these KPIs and throw money at them. Um, And that can be just a little bit insulting. And a lot of times it's, it's a waste of money. Uh, and so we've we've been able to do a, a lot of research and show that uh, you can actually spend significantly less dollars and attach a better engagement to um, to a, a program. The problem is, and the reason that that isn't very well known across the entire world, is that it requires a lot of effort, a lot of work, and a lot of creativity. So, so Bruce, like kind of what you just said, you know, sitting down and having these conversations with your agents and sitting down and, and having these planning meetings it's much easier to just pay some money for a program and say, uh, I hope this works. And then we can check off the gamification box. Um, and so that Bruce, that's one of the biggest no, no's in an engagement program. Um, if you're, if you're not going to really spend the time and if you're not going to really try to be creative and, and, and make it an adaptable program, then save yourself the, the effort and the money and just, just give everybody a raise. <laughs> Okay. No, those are great. Great. Other other elements that um, you know, with regard to behavior, schedules, et cetera, that we should be thinking about here as well. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. So, uh, the when Snowfly was uh, founded, uh, the principles it was founded on were the, the behavior modification principles. Um, so I've talked a lot about this excitement or that the small isolated events. Um, so what ends up happening? There's this. The, there's these things called reinforcement schedules. Um, so, for example, there's a, um, a fixed interval schedule, which means that every 14 days I get a paycheck. So that's a fixed schedule. And what we can show is that right as you're, you receive that activity, whether it's a recognition, whether it's a paycheck, whether it's commission, I will perform really well for about a day before and a day after that fixed interval event. But then in between those two interval events, my, my actions and my engagement with the activity drops down significantly. And so it's kind of, it's almost a, a parabola where I perform really well for a minute and then I drop down and then I perform, you know, I perform better as I get closer to the next fixed interval. Um, and mm. most incentive and gamification programs are based on that schedule of reinforcement. Um, and so what do you do for those 10 days in the middle where your behavior and your activities are actually badly performing um, so there's actually four schedules of reinforcement I will or five and I, I won't go into all of those right now but the most important one that we have seen with behavior change is a, a variable um, a variable ratio schedule and what that means is um, the reinforcement is unpredictable and you don't know how much and that seems really illogical because if you don't know that it's coming and you don't know how much it's for then why would you care about it but it's that idea of going to Las Vegas and putting a quarter in a slot machine. Like the human brain is wired 
to have that that kind of nuance or that excitement of of not knowing exactly what's going to happen. And when you can create that, when you can put that into an engagement program um, in a, um, a you know in in any kind of engagement program, that schedule of reinforcement, you that's where you really start changing behavior. And then the behavior curves um, are flat. You you can generate a, a pretty a pretty predictable um, performance metric instead of having that parabola curve. So going back to your question, Bruce, you know, what are some of the don'ts? Um, again, don't be lazy. Don't use the easy schedule of reinforcement. Figure out how to be creative and create some of these new principles to, to speak to people's brains. Like find out what drives humans and, and kind of use that. Um, and another don't is, is what I like to call confirmation bias. Uh, so our brains are, are set up to um, to not retain all of the information that we receive. Because um, if we retained all the information we received, there would be so much information. Like we'd remember people's shirt colors and, and how many steps we took from the car and, you know, all of those kind of things. It's unnecessary. So our brain has this tool called confirmation bias that takes information, says this is not information, and it dumps it. Confirmation bias. Mm. And what ends up happening is as soon as somebody opens up a PowerPoint, our brain says, oh, confirmation bias, bleh, I'm done. Or as soon as I open, you know, whatever that, that activity might be that is overused and boring, it triggers our brain's confirmation bias. And so, again, going back to that creativity, we need to make sure that we're doing something that's just new enough that our brain has to process it and think about it and try to figure out how to engage or how to improve or how to uh, build up or whatever it may be so that it's, it's new enough to our brain that it doesn't hit our confirmation bias and then just drop right, right out of our brain. Oh, so, again, it keeps coming back to this lazy program. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. No, if you're going to do something, you got to do it well. That's what my dad always said. Exactly. Uh, it really makes a difference. And, you know, some of the things you were talking about earlier, too, with regard to the way the brain works and how it responds and uh, gambling and slot machines and that sort of thing. <laughs> I mean, I can remember the I, first time I went to uh, Las Vegas – and I was just in my early 20s, I uh, uh, quickly dropped 40 bucks. I looked around and I said, you know, they didn't build this place because people win, you know. <laughs> they built it exactly. because they make money off of it. But uh, So that taught me something about both, uh, you know, what gambling industry is all about and also what the human mind is about because obviously people keep coming back for more. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, – it's kind of an interesting thing, and if you can, you know, tie into it and do it in an ethical way, obviously, in your, <laughs> in your center, then you're doing everybody a favor, uh, your, your, your clients, uh, your customers, your senior managers, and, and the people mm -hmm. themselves, because they will feel better about coming into work every day. So that's mm -hmm. uh, really and I, good stuff. I do want to jump in there, Bruce, and say I'm not a proponent of gambling but I am a proponent of understanding how the brain works. <laughs> yes. No, exactly. exactly. Well, you know, after that experience, I just, uh, and I've been to Vegas many times for uh, events and things, but I haven't gambled at all because I just remember losing. <laughs> and that's yeah. what I thought. And, but there was one time when I was walking by the Bellagio and they were having one of these uh, fountain things and uh, uh, Pavarotti was singing uh, an aria. And I, I went into the, uh, the the casino. I dropped twenty five cents in, and I said, "Okay, you deserve this. That was a great show." <laughs> <laughs> anyway, well, you know, many of our listeners have probably tried or, or seen a gamification program that's failed, or it just hasn't shown the ROI. And with your experience, and you've already talked a little bit about this, but maybe you could uh, go into a little more detail. Um, you know about that and you know is there real value to be found here mm -hmm. certainly yeah so um so if you go out and just google gamification today you're going to find a couple dozen maybe even a hundred uh, different gamification companies um and and the reason is is because of the new generation um people are are kind of drawn to that um but one of the reasons that, and I kind of covered a few of them already, but one of the big reasons why a lot of these gamification programs keep failing or have a very short life lifespan, you know, it looks really cool and it looks really exciting, and then your users stop using it after a couple of weeks or, you know, a couple of months, yeah. um, is because those programs are not based on the behavioral science. They're based mm -hmm. on, uh, and again, I, I don't want to sound over, overly negative, but they're, they're based on the principles of drugs, like this one-time hit 
that, mm-hmm. you know, it doesn't really do that much for me, and it's a, a very temporary experience. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's this idea of avoiding programs that are focused on pizzazz and, and right. you know, way too much excitement, way over the top, and, and miss out on the, on the science aspect of what is actually happening in the human brain. And mm-hmm. um, and that's really where the ROI problems come in is, is, again, because if you're not focusing on your business goals or if you're only right. focusing on one aspect of an agent's uh, life for their, you know, one, one aspect of their job, you're missing out mm-hmm. or even damaging your bottom line by, you know, by creating the, the wrong activities or getting people interested right. in, in even the wrong things. Um, you know, so, there's a lot of great information oh, in – Oh, no, I was mm-hmm. just saying, thinking, uh, unfortunately, our time is going. Uh, there's some, so much to talk about. I think we could take two hours <laughs> on this. But uh, can I just ask, um, you know, one of the things that uh, we've seen is that with any kind of program, it's it's good to take a crawl, walk, run approach usually, mm-hmm. um, and particularly if you're introducing something new, uh, particularly if you're not already in, you know, a crisis mode or something like that. And, and you're basically looking <laughs> at this as a way to uh, improve what you've already got, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, my advice is always pilot, whatever it is. And um, could you just talk a little bit about that before we go to questions? Uh, because I think it's important for our listeners to hear. I love it, yeah. And you kind of mentioned it already or earlier in the in the conversation. Um, this this idea of uh, of getting a pulse on the situation, getting a pulse with your people. Um, we always tell our clients to start small. Um, and really find the, the low-hanging fruit. There's always something you can do, especially if you do understand your business goals, that you can start with that activity and, and see what, what your agents and your managers and supervisors respond to, and, and then take that program. And if you, if you found a good program, it will easily be able to grow with you and add the features that your people are the most, most interested in. Um, so I love that you use this word, this, this idea pilot. And, and even a pilot's not always necessary but the easiest way to start is to just start a, a recognition program. Um, just start a small little, you know, add the gamification principles so that, that your agents can get used to it. You can get some feedback from them. You can kind of understand what that program is. Um, and then like you just said, and I, I, I like the way you said that, small incremental steps. Um, and, and going back to your, your previous question, uh, some of the problems we see in these programs is you, you bite off more than you can chew. And so we, we build this extravagant, awesome, incredible program that we spent hundreds of thousands of dollars developing and testing and doing all these things. And then our agents only use, you know, a quarter of the program because that's really what speaks to them and our culture. Um, And so it's better to find that low-hanging fruit, try a couple of small things, and then go the direction that your culture and your agents define for you as they're using the program. Great. Oh, these are great. Okay, well, in the uh, few minutes that we have left, let's go to, to questions. And, uh, Alan, uh, do you have some questions for us? Yes, we got a couple questions here. Uh, the first one is from Jason. He's asking, how do I recover from a bad program? Can we fix it, or should we just start over? <laughs> <laughs> Good question, Jason. So my answer is you can always recover. Um so it, it's one of those, you know, don't throw the baby out with bath water. Um, and it kind of goes back to what I was just talking about starting small. Um, chances are there are parts of the program that are working. And, and again, you're probably only using a quarter of the program. And so what, uh, what I would suggest is, again, finding where's the low-hanging fruit, what is, what's the business goal that we could actually accomplish, and then work with your program to see if you could scale back down to that one business goal or that one small um, activity. Um, and then from there, you can regrow and, and but follow those steps that I mentioned before of figuring out what is our what do our agents care about, what is our business goals, and what's the culture. Um, and if you can if you can do that, I mean, I mean, if the engagement program, if you bought some software, if you're engaged with the company, and they can't retract like that and then grow, then it might be time to throw out that bathwater and, and and maybe start new with a, a program that's more flexible that can do that retraction and expansion with you rather than being a solidified or too rigid. Yeah, no, I, I'd agree with that. I mean, I think there's always possibilities for redemption, and you should use them. Uh, but just uh, <laughs> don't make the same mistake twice or make another mistake. Right. In other words, analyze what went wrong, really 
understand it and figure out something that is going to work. Uh, and you know, talk to your people and uh, talk to your supervisors, talk to those folks who will uh, – colleagues, uh, people at um, you know, uh, events, trade events, and things like that who will be able to give you some good inputs on that. So that's great. Mm -hmm. Alan, do we have another question as well in the time remaining? Yes, we have, we have a couple more. We have one from Darren. Darren asks, does it have to be an expensive program? Or how long and how long does it take for a good implementation take? Good questions. Um, gamification and incentive programs should be very affordable. Um, you should not be spending very much on these programs. Um, and again, because if you're spending a lot, chances are you're trying to do too much, um, and you're trying to focus more on pizzazz and on these peripheral features that are really not accomplishing your business goal. They may seem cool, and people might get really excited about them, but it's it's really not going to benefit or provide the ROI that it's maybe promising. Um, so a, a good program, um, especially to set up very specific, you know, like a, rec a good recognition program with a couple of KPIs that really fit into your culture and create some good excitement, shouldn't take more than 30 or 45 days to set up and integrate, because um, you'll, you'll want to make sure that parts of it are automated, because... Um, <laughs> Little sidebar: If you're uh, if if you're expecting your supervisors to push forward a program, expect that program to last no longer than six months, because either a supervisor is going to leave and the next person is not going to care, or the supervisor will get sick of managing it. Um, so again, make sure it's not expensive, but make sure that it's that it is integrated, and you should be able to set up a pretty quick, uh, not a pretty quick, a good program pretty quickly. Usually 30 to 45 days. Okay. Uh, I have nothing further to add to that. That's a great answer. And uh, do we have one more question we can fit in, Alan? Yes, we have one more from Jose. And his question is, is it really worth all the hassle to have a gamification or engagement program? <laughs> Jose, tell us how you really feel here. <laughs> <laughs> is this all worth it? Elijah? Uh, the the very short answer is heck yes. I mean, absolutely yes. Um, recently, we've seen um, we've seen a KPI increase within 30 days. We saw an increase 40%. Um, we've seen attendance rates um, improve uh, by 12 to 15% over a, a period of a couple of months. Um, again, the low-hanging fruit, the the changes that you can make in the call center and the cultural changes you can make it at a very low cost are easy and, and very cost effective. Um, and so I just have to kind of drive home those points. It has to be the right kind of program. You need to be on the three pillars. Um, you need to be using behavioral science. It needs to be set up creatively. Um, but the ROI on some of these programs can be astronomical. And then the, non, the intangibles can be huge. I mean, building a good recognition program where people are communicating and uplifting people. Um, I mean, I was just listening to Freakonomics Radio this morning. And it's proven over and over that people's behavior changes from positive reinforcement. And, and, and you, you hurt culture and hurt productivity with, with criticism and correction. Um, so, oh, man, the changes you can make with a good engagement gamification program are just incredible. Okay, great, great uh, question. I'm afraid that we're at the end of our time now. That's a, a great answers. And, you know, the only thing I'd add to that is that, as with anything in the contact center and in life, you know, good planning, uh, piloting, uh, be ready to adjust as necessary as you go. Those are all uh, really key ingredients to, to make sure that this whole thing works. Well, Elijah, this has been a great uh, program. I really appreciate your input. Uh, I think our listeners will have gotten a lot out of it, so thank you very much. Is there any last thank thing you'd you, like to add before we hand things over to Alan? Uh, thank you. Thanks for having me on, and go have some fun. Break the mundane today, and you'll see the gamification works. Sounds good. Sounds good. Okay, and you'll hear that Pavarotti aria in the background as you uh, as you succeed. <laughs> so that's great. Okay. <laughs> Thanks so much for being on, and uh, with that, we'll hand things over to Alan. Thanks again to Elijah Cox and Bruce Belfiore for your insightful discussion on today's show. Be sure to join us next month for another great show and look at our huge selection of archived shows and topics at BenchmarkPortal.com. 
Then click on Call Talk, where you'll find over nine seasons of this show. From all of us at Benchmark Portal, keep those headsets steady and your fingers ready. This is Alan signing out. Have a great day.